Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I, I'm really excited um, for this presentation. Um, my name is Robbie Boyer. I am uh, one of the uh, uh, PIs for the Integrated Network for Social Sustainability. Um, and I'm going to use this presentation to talk about the different ways that the concept of social sustainability is used. Um, one of the objectives of this network is to clarify the concept of social sustainability. Um, and uh, my hope is that this presentation can launch and organize conversations about this concept moving forward um, within the network and amongst individuals. I want to give you the punchline of this talk first um, before, I, uh, before I jump in, into it, um, which is that there are five basic ways that at least I've identified uh, social sustainability being used. Um, and this descends from a, uh, this, this descends to a more and more holistic way uh, where uh, we see social sustainability as a very distinct and separate um, concept, separate from the other uh, traditional pillars, uh, economic and environmental pillars of sustainability, um, and into a more holistic um, and encompassing concept. Um, uh, so uh, the five pillars, just uh, going over them, is uh, a distinct pillar. Um, and then the second is a constraint upon the other pillars, which is actually very similar to um, what we saw in our keynote address from, from Ajo Amakuzi Kennedy. Um, the third is a facilitator of environmental progress. Um, it, helps, uh, it helps the other pillars progress. The fourth is a driver, um, which is different than a facilitator. It's actually the motivation for change in the other pillars. And the fourth, uh, uh, sorry, the fifth is person-centered sustainability where um, we uh, effectively know, we see uh, uh, no distinction between them. Uh, that's definitely the most utopian and the one that I hope stimulates the most conversation. There's a lot of room for imagination in that one. So let's, let's jump into this. Um, first of all, uh, this slide is missing an enormous graphic. Um, but I can go through it. Why, why is this concept of social su sustainability so elusive? If you read articles about social sustainability, sometimes they're referred to as, the concept is referred to as chaotic. Um, it is um, definitely underrepresented in the academic literature. Um, I, I, I did a quick um, Google Ngram. I, I just discovered Google Ngram, which scans all the books in the, in the Google um, Books library for how often different words are used, and, and of, of the three pillars, it's used the least. Um, and why is it so elusive? Well, um, uh, Bostrem, who is from, who is from Sweden, uh, he gives six, six different reasons, and I had them all up on this slide, but if I can remember them, there are, first of all, um, the ambitions of social sustainability are, are, um, are very, very high, and not, we don't always agree on them. And so we can become, uh, it can become discouraging when we don't achieve lots and lots of different social ambitions. Um, there is an institutional separation between um, social and environmental. So we often have bureaucratic mechanisms that look at environmental stuff and bureaucratic uh, uh, bureaucracies that look at uh, social stuff and we, we separate them institutionally. Um, social imperatives tend to be co-opted by uh, global capitalism. Uh, so, uh, whereas we might see a social initiative working on the ground or at the grassroots, um, as it begins to scale up, it gets co-opted uh, with, with the global market. Um, uh, let's see, some of the other reasons. Um, I, I, can't I can't remember all of them at the moment. You know what? I actually have the presentation here. Um, Uh, oh, it's been historically marginalized. So sustainability was uh, originally created as an environmental, um, sustainable development was created as an environmental classification. And, and so it has been kind of pushed to the side. It's been seen as the, um, the red-headed stepchild, no offense to any red-headed stepchildren, of, of the sustainability framework. Um, and there's also confusion about, confusion about substantial versus procedural um, 
sustainability. Um, and that tends to confuse what social sustainability is really all about. Um, of course, uh, another reason that social sustainability tends to be elusive is that um, environmental and economic uh, issues are all ultimately social. They're mediated by human language, by human politics and institutions. So um, the market is a social institution. The environment, what we consider the environment or not the environment. I was talking with um, um, some network members earlier today about um, how historically the environment has been seen as this idyllic, pristine, green space. Our keynote speaker from last year talked about how we need to begin to see the environment as, um, as all spaces, as the urban environment and all spaces that we inhabit. And that's mediated by social structure. So um, these, are, these things are all social. So when we talk about social sustainability, they tend to get confused with one another. Um, in, the, in recent years, there has been a, actually a, a whole proliferation of different frameworks to describe social sustainability. Um, uh, these scholars, Valence et al. Um, from New Zealand, describe uh, social sustainability as uh, development sustainability, meaning um, the ability to um, uh, uh, increasing the quality of life for you know, low income and impoverished nations, maintenance, meaning uh, holding on to uh, social elements that are important, um, and then bridge, which is the transition between social and environmental sustainability. Um, I'll go through these other frameworks pretty quickly. Um, Cuddle described um, how social sustainability is made up of, uh, of these major frameworks, including social capital, so social equity, social infrastructure, and engaged governance, and that ultimately um, uh, this is how we can understand this, this broader concept. Um, Sorry, Murphy describes it, uh, the four preeminent concepts of the social pillar, equity, um, awareness, participation, and social cohesion. And all of these are um, ultimately dissecting what, it, what social sustainability looks like from the inside, right? Uh, what, is, what is encompassed in all of this? And um, these are all really important studies. What I'm gonna try and do with these five uh, different uses of social sustainability is uh, examine how they, how we have conceived of social sustainability as interacting with the other pillars. What role does it play um, externally, not, not what does it look like on the inside. Um, so this is, a, this is kind of looking, looking down at social, looking at social sustainability from the outside. Um, what does it do? And as I said before, um, it is used as a distinct pillar. It's operationalized as a distinct pillar, as um, sometimes a constraint on the other pillars. Um, I need to actually reverse, it's a facilitator of environmental progress, socially driven environmental progress, or finally, um, uh, in inclusive decision-making or people-centered sustainability. So let's go through all of these. Oh, goodness, again. Um, okay, so um, th there were some great images here. Um, so first of all, we can think of social sustainability as a distinct pillar. Um, and this is probably the most common way that academic literature looks at it. Where, um, and, and the way this is typically operationalized, hopefully if this image on the next page works, ah, where, um, for example, scholars will look at what is the effect of X on social sustainability, as if social sustainability was its own thing. Um, so Bramley and Power here, they, they come up with a definition of social sustainability, which is basically the absence of bad things. Um, they describe social sustainability as the absence of uh, neighborhood dissatisfaction, things like graffiti and, uh, and vandalism, um, the absence of, uh, sorry, uh, and the absence of, or basically the inverse of the difficulty of access to certain amenities. They create this index of social sustainability and they say, what is the relationship between density and these bad things? Um, and then they say, uh, social sustainability goes up or down. There's really no discussion about how this relates to sustainability globally or the, the other pillars. So um, another example from, from my discipline of urban planning, um, Saha and Patterson examined the way that different cities uh, use sustainability in their plans and their programs. And they took an inventory of different policies that a city could could implement, they took uh, environmental protection policies, they made a list of economic development policies, and they made a list of social justice and equity. They, did, they, they made these lists very carefully, 
right? It was through a review of the literature and a survey of 60 different experts in sustainable development. And then they, they saw, uh, then they measured um, how cities were accomplishing these three different categories. And in this case, social sustainability is a separate thing, right? There's no, there's no explicit attempt to see how it interacts with the other pillars. Okay, so this is, um, from what I observe, and, and we can talk about this later, the most common way of doing it. Why? Um, because it's expedient. We can collect data and we can very quickly and uh, over and over again say, okay, this is social sustainability, how are we doing on social sustainability? Okay. Um, it's also rec replicable. If you have uh, data that you can systematically get, um, you can conduct the same search at different scales um, over and over again. There are some obvious disadvantages. First of all, it divorces social issues from economic and environmental, um, right? It, while it's very easy, it's very expedient, uh, the assumption is that you can examine social issues separately from economic issues and environmental issues, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of sustainability in the first place, which is that these issues are, are integrated, right? So we, we sacrifice, ex we sacrifice um, the integration for expediency. Um, Another major issue is that uh, we have to determine where these boundaries lie. And uh, if we go back to Saha and Patterson, um, I, I could very easily make the case that um, oh, uh, sustainable food systems uh, here under the social justice inequity could, could easily be economic development, depending on for whom those systems are working. Right, so uh, these boundaries are, I think, subjective. There often isn't a, uh, an explication of how they end up in these different categories. We're just kind of forced to trust um, whoever is making them that they are, in fact, representing this pillar. Um, and, uh, and the measurements, of course, uh, like most of these other categories, um, if you don't have the right data, you, you can't, uh, it, you need, it, it, these categories are dependent upon the data that you have. Um, and so if you wanted to measure something like social capital, there's really no easy data source for social capital, um, which is an issue that we'll, we'll get to in a second. So that's distinct pillar. Okay, the, the second way that social sustainability is used um, is a constraint upon the other pillars. Um, and this is a, 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 an integrated way at looking at um, social sustainability. Um, and for those of you that have taken a class in urban planning, you've probably seen the, the planner's triangle before. Uh, you're, if you're not an urban planner, you've probably seen this in your discipline at some point. Um, but Scott Campbell, he's a, he's a planning uh, professor at University of Michigan. And uh, he argued that, um, you know, th th there are these three priorities within the urban planning discipline. Planners want to protect the environment. They want to, um, they want to stimulate economic growth and they want to do it equitably. And um, they need to do all things, three things at once, but oftentimes these things, things contradict. So planners' day-to-day -day lives are coping with the conflicts between these, right? Property conflict between social, uh, between social equity and economic development. We've seen this for, hundreds, for over 100 years, right? Uh, tenement housing in New York City in the early 20th century um, was a classic contradiction between economic development on one hand, right, uh, and, and social equity. Uh, the New York City was growing very fast, they, they needed housing, and people were making, uh, or landowners were profiting very heavily off of this, um, but people were living in deplorable living conditions, um, and uh, riots ensued, and fires ensued, and people were dying, and so planners, actually the, the earliest, arguably earliest professional urban planners had to resolve this contradiction, otherwise uh, they were going to, the society would have collapsed, it would have, you know, they were, or they were encountering some some uh, very disturbing consequences. So anyway, um, what this triangle illustrates is that you, you, you constantly have to reconcile these different conflicts and any vertex is, is an asymptote, right? If you get too close to any, one of the other vertices will pull you back. How do you operationalize this? Well, I think our keynote speaker, um, uh, Dr. Amikudzi, uh, has operationalized this in, in a really admirable way. Um, she and her colleagues have said, that uh, sustainable development or sustainability footprint is maximizing quality of life um, uh, without, uh, uh, while minimizing your ecological impact, right? How can, we need to do these, both, both of these things at once so we can evaluate one against the, the maximization or minimization of the other. Um, 
And so she and her colleagues have used uh, sustain, uh, social sustainability or have operationalized sustainability, social sustainability rather, as a constraint upon the other pillars. Um, okay, so the advantages of this. Of course, it integrates categories that have been historically separated, uh, institutionally separated. Um, and it acknowledges the inherently social nature of environmental and economic issues. Um, limitations of this approach, right? Um, can the method be uh, used beyond uh, individual projects or, or interventions? Uh, this is at the time I had read her 2009 paper when she was measuring uh, the sustainability of a, of, a, of a highway project over time. Um, and I think she answered very well that it can be used uh, beyond different projects. Um, can it be used, uh, can we use uh, more complex uh, indices to um, proxy for social sustainability, right? So when we have three dimensions, uh, suddenly the question becomes much more complex and can we integrate more rich variables to symbolize social sustainability? Um, and, uh, and how do these things over change over time, right? Um, so um, this of course, th there are data limitations to this. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, those are the constraints upon this approach. Okay, number three, um, a facilitator of environmental progress, um, which is to say that in order to accomplish complex uh, or, or major changes in society, um, we need to have social capital, right? Um, or, um, or the inverse, right, the opposite is that if we have an isolated, fragmented, distrustful population, um, it's hard to accomplish much. It's hard to uh, accomplish environmental change or, or solve problems. Um, uh, so this third, this third right, a, a facilitator of environmental progress um, means right, a, a shared a common sense of purpose. It's a precondition uh, for governance in achieving complex goals. Um, and we see this across, uh, across the social sustainability literature. It's something that um, scholars talk about a lot. Uh, I want to plug my research, uh, which uh, I, I spend time in eco-villages, in uh, communities that are, that are ide ideologically committed to low environmental impact. Um, and what's fascinating about these places is that they're able to do this mostly through social mechanisms. Um, so Dancing Rabbit Eco-Village, this is in, in Rutledge, Missouri, they live at one-tenth the ecological footprint of the, the average American. Um, so for example, 75 people share three cars in a very rural environment where if you, if you need to get anything, if, and unless you grow it on site, you need to drive a far distance. And so 75 people share three cars and they do this through really interesting uh, communication methods in ways that most people would find very unnatural. They share, uh, with everyone they share, they share where they're going, when they're gonna be back, uh, what they're getting. And so uh, if uh, my neighbor is going into town to buy nails, um, I know that and I can say, hey, will you return my library books for me? Um, and it's, a, it's a, a method of communication that we, in, it, we people in the mainstream would find probably unnatural sharing with our neighbors. And this is an investment. They've, they've learned how to do this. Um, and, uh, and so this extraordinary, this, this extraordinary investment, I would argue, has facilitated very low um, environmental impact. Um, so there's, there's strong theoretical support for this, but there's not good empirical support yet. There's not a lot of evidence that shows, that, that shows this relationship, so it's, it's a gap, it's an opportunity. And there's also, there's no um, consensus, and uh, maybe, maybe I, we can talk about this, um, but I have not seen a consensus metric on what defines social sustain, or sorry, uh, social capital. I think it would probably vary across scales um, and across contexts. And there are, of course, ide in my research, there are ideological barriers to implementation to implementing collectivist living situations. Um, so um, they, they might get stamped as communist or socialist, even though um, I would argue that they're not. Um, but there are, you know, uh, getting funding to, to study uh, eco-villages uh, might scare some, some funding organizations. Um, okay, fourth, again, wish the graphics had shown up. Um, socially driven environmental progress. Um, and I contrast this to uh, technologically driven environmental progress where we have value change and we have ideological change driving um, 
our, our changes in technology. So um, in contrast, technologically driven environmental change would say, okay, we can tweak machines here, we can change, uh, you know, we can, we can enchain, uh, change the efficiency of our vehicles, and we can solve all of our problems. We don't ourselves have to change. Whereas socially driven environmental change is, okay, we have resolved as a human species or as a community to change, and then the technological changes follow. So that's the fourth way I see social sustainability use, is social change is driving, it's not a merely a constraint or a facilitator, it is driving environmental change and economic change. Um, and um, this is, uh, uh, if anyone has read John Robinson's Squaring the Circle article, he talks about how um, the history of sustainability and environmentalism is, can be uh, characterized by this, ever, uh, this never ending fight between value change and technology fix. Uh, where um, you know there, there's always a, a perspective of people that say, okay, we need fundamental change. We need to change the way that we think, and we need to change our conception, uh, our, our, our how we conceive ourselves relative to nature, versus a camp that says, oh, well, you know, sustainability is just around the corner. It's just a matter of you know more greener gadgets or, or uh, uh, quick market mechanisms. Of course, this is probably a false dichotomy. It probably takes both. Um, and, uh, but this is one way that the concept is operationalized. I would also put uh, Julian Agamemnon's uh, theory of just sustainability. He was our keynote speaker last year, and he talked about, um, you know, uh, just sustainability involves a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift um, conceiving, um, right, that conceives of justice issues as environmental issues that the reason that communities are, su are suffering environmentally has everything to do with social equity and social justice. These things can't be changed. So if we want to change environmental problems, we need to first look at distributive and, and, and justice, uh, distributive justice and, and social equity. Um, so it's environmental change driven by uh, social change. Okay, uh, of course this is very ambitious and comprehensive. Um, and it's a, it's a prescriptive model for sustainability, so it's not merely looking at the relationship between social and environmental sustainability. Um, but of course, right, this is, uh, its, its biggest advantage is also its biggest obstacle. It's very ambitious, and, um, and so there are many ideological and structural barriers. Um, and I, my question is, what role can technology and market-based change play in socially driven, socially driven environmental progress? Uh, the fifth category um, is uh, what I call person-centered sustainability, um, which is uh, teeters on, right, can very easily be misconstrued as participatory planning, uh, which has been abused in the past when governments uh, participate the public, right? When governments say, okay, we've gotten your feedback, we invited you to a meeting, we've got your feedback, now we're going to move forward. Um, but person-centered sustainability um, and again, this is something that I hope we can, we can begin to talk about as a group once I'm done uh, lecturing. Um, but this would involve the identification that every single person has environmental, social equity, and economic priorities that they're constantly trying to balance. And when I begin to use your priorities as my constraints, um, then we begin to have uh, this very democratic um, this de very democratic system of decision making, um, and we can begin to, and we be, and, and when we prioritize each other, um, then sustainable solutions, right, long-term sustainable solutions will emerge from that. So it, be, it, it breaks down the three pillars into understanding uh, the priorities that we all balance every day. Um, and I, and uh, I, I can think of a few examples of this in urban planning. Um, scholars, for example, that are thinking of ways that we can share each other's plans a lot more easily, uh, where we set up systems where um, your plans become the constraints upon my plans, uh, so that we're not trying to co-opt and create a consensus out of everyone, but everyone is using each other's plans as input to their decisions. Um, again, this is, this is a, I think, a, a utopian, uh, a very hopeful type of social sustainability. Um, and one that would, I think, requires a lot more thought, but one I want to invite conversation around. Um, so, um, advantages, of course, this is ambitious. Um, 
and there's strong support for human scale design strategies. Last, last night we heard from, uh, some of us heard from Dick Jackson that talked about, you know, if, if we put people first, then we can solve a lot of the environmental problems that we've encountered. Um, but it might be seen as utopian, um, and it would require new ways of communicating, I think, um, and, uh, and overcoming part, or quote unquote participatory practices where communities are, are co-opted and, and uh, participation is um, maybe used uh, to, to, to forward an agenda that might not be democratic. Um, and the, the focus on individuals could be construed as, as neoliberal, right? If we put the responsibility on individuals, then suddenly we, we, we run into um, we, to, to neoliberal territory where, um, where, where personal responsibility becomes a, um, a, a cornerstone of sustainability. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe we have to think about this a little bit more. Okay. So new directions. Um, first of all, I, I I would be excited to, to back these up more with, with more empirical data, right? Um, find case studies that, uh, that support these. Um, and I also think that we can, we can test this with systematic... Uh, this is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary network, uh, and, and I think one of the strengths of this network is that um, I, can, I can check my observations in urban planning against observations in engineering and psychology and anthropology. Um, I think there's, there's opportunity to look at the temporal psychological challenge of, of acting for the future. Um, Poonam uh, is, is, I know, very interested in this and, and she can talk about it later, but uh, we, tend, uh, we, tend to put, we tend to prioritize our decisions for the short term and not look at problems in the long term. So there's a temporal element here that that I think we need to discuss. Um, I mentioned uh, before in urban planning, integrated system of plans is a, as an inclusive plan making process. Um, and of course, I would, I, I'd like to open up um, the floor for suggestions because um, this, is, this is a panel. It, it's not a, a presentation. Um, so uh, these, are, these are my observations and I'm excited to hear um, from you. Thank you, Robbie. I enjoyed your presentation. I have a question and then a comment. Yep. So my question is, what is social sustainability? After presenting all these um, ways of thinking about them, can you shed some light on that? If, if somebody walked in here, let's say the mayor of Charlotte, and asked you what is social sustainability, what would you be inclined to tell them? And then the second comment I want to, well, the, the comment I want to make is that um, I like this idea of um, value-driven environmental change because, and I think you talked about that in the second uh, approach you, 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 you offered. So you, you, you said that um, there is technological, technologically driven environmental change and then there is socially driven environmental change. And I think even the um, ecologists recognize that because they have two categories of thinking. One is deep ecology, and the other one is shallow ecology. And shallow ecology, I think, can be related to technologically driven environment. It's kind of a, a fixes at the margin, right? right? Whereas deep ecology really involves a transformation of behavior, right? So that you are really becoming sustainable in the long run. Um, and uh, perhaps, the, the latter is more of strong sustainability because it involves uh, thinking about the entire system and the life cycle. Uh, but the thing I'm grappling with is what social sustainability is. So I'm back to the question. Uh, and so the, the presentation, my hope was to show that there are, there are five major ways that sus social sustainability is conceived. If, if you look at social sustainability as an isolated pillar, um, it, I think it limits your ability to say, uh, it, it divorces social sustainability from other pillars. So I think that limits the power of, of the concept, right? If, it, if, it's, if social sustainability is not related to environmental or economic sustainability, 
um, then it, it's no different from a quality of life study or, you know, um, and so I think we, we divorce ourselves from the idea of sustainability completely. Um, so I, I, if I, so to answer the question, uh, it, you know, there are different ways of doing it, but each of them have advantages and disadvantages, right? And so I think um, scholars moving forward, when they use that term, when they think about that concept, they might be able to explicate, okay, this is what I mean by social sustainability. I mean it as a constraint upon the other, right, the, the other factors. I am dissatisfied with authors and, and practitioners that say, okay, um, you know, we have high education rates, we have, um, you know, uh, access to parks, um, uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, access to healthcare. We did social sustainability. Well, that hasn't moved us forward on the other issues uh, of, of global environmental problems and um, global environmental crises. I think that there's much more potential for the idea if it is integrated with the others. That's my opinion. Um, yeah. Any other? Yeah. Uh, just, just had a question. We've talked a lot about um, economic and social and environmental, but what I don't hear is anything very much directly related to the political. And finally, the political setting in all of the as a as a key institution, I would argue, is almost. I'm going to say as, I mean, again, there's no point in putting a judgment call on it, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm just struck that we're not discussing the political context in which these definitions are being played out. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that politics are kind of inherent in, in all of these conceptions, right? So um, politics determines what indicators get chosen for these different pillars or what indicators are valid. Uh, politics are involved in how you would use a metric like AJO's uh, in in policy making. Um, so I think I think uh, p politics is a social institution about how to um, and and I'm not a political scientist, but the way I w would understand it is how how do we um, how do we deal with limited resources, right? How do we make how do we make difficult decisions? And so um, you know I. I, I don't know what the concept of political sustainability would look like because it's not like a, it's not a stock that we're trying to uh, it's not a capital stock right that or it's not something that we can maintain um, so I, but I, I think it's undeniable that politics are a part of using these metrics and determining whether they're valid or, or how they get used that's how I see it yeah Um, to, to pick up on that point a bit, because uh, we were also talking about it in terms of human capital, if, if you're interested in that. So how do you um, look at, um, uh, you know, the opposite, you could say the opposite of social sustainability is civil war. Um, and uh, there you have governmental breakdown. Um, so the question of sort of who is represented in the political process and at what levels is, is one way to measure um, as one element in um, human capital. And so it, so it seems to me that, that we do need to uh, think about um, how that type of governance gets adjudicated. Yeah. And it's, a, it, 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 it's complicated, but it's certainly can, relevant, and it can be done in think, whether we're thinking about it in terms of capital functions or in terms of these different the distinct pillars or constraints or socially driven. And clearly, uh, one of the biggest um, problems for sustainability is uh, war and social disintegration. Yeah, uh, so I guess uh, branching off that point, if, um, you know, is war, right, if we, if we take civil war as a social sustainability problem, right, is that a, 
is that a cause, right? Uh, or is it a consequence of other sustainability problems? And, right, and, and sorry. It's both, exactly, right, exactly. And I think, I think um, if it is seen as, as one or the other, right, it, um, then the concept of social sustainability as, it, as relating to the other pillars kind of loses its power. So, yeah, so, yeah. I, th I think it's, when you start to describe sustainability as civil war being a, a consequence of sustainability problems, you start, it, it can get dangerous because you know, sustain sustainability is when good things happen and non-sustainability is when bad things happen. So then the question becomes, so why aren't we going after all of these, you know, why aren't we well on our way to making this happen? Um, which kind of think gets back to your question about political will. If, if sustainability is good things, why, why, is there no why is there less political will than we would like to make it happen? Um, and so I think that is, I don't have a great answer to that question. I think it's, a lot of it is because it's expensive um, and that it can cost to vote depending on where you are. Um, but I think that when you, when you start to use the word sustainability as a fill-in for these kinds of things, it can get tricky very quickly. I guess I liked your point where you started to say if we look at politics basically as an allocation of scarce resources, which is a kind of baseline definition, what you're often talking about in some of these pieces are the ideologies that fit in to that sort of, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a range we're talking about in terms of political institutions. I thought the question today about market and capitalism was really great because that really is the institutional frame of the economic and the political scene in which these things are being played out. And I think that to ignore the institutional frame, whether it's nation state or global, is to sort of make it, I don't want to say irrelevant, but I think we're really missing out on a core framing of the kinds of issues we're wanting to understand. And even you know, the UN and the World Bank have moved much towards, towards to try and understand institutional robustness as opposed to just economic development. I mean, there is a real shift in the recognition of the power and value of the institutional piece uh, as far as the way in which these get played out. So it's just, again, to kind of build off. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. It, it makes me reflect on, right, it, it, if, these, if, if these are, um, let's, let's just say we, we take these five different ways that social sustainability is used. Can they be useful? Can a uh, number four, right, uh, socially driven sustainability, can that be useful to elected government? Right, if, you know, uh, can, um, can the world, or can the United States government facilitate socially motivated environmental progress? What are the institutional barriers to doing that? And so I think th this type of framework sets up a question like that, right? How could an institution like Mecklenburg County use number one, uh, right? Uh, what, were, what are the institutional barriers to using that conception of social sustainability. Why might it be really easy? It's really easy because you, all you have to do is pick a bunch of indicators and say, we did it, um, or we didn't. Uh, there's no obligation to connect them to the other pillars. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment or stream of consciousness thinking here, but um, it, it, it sort of strikes me that we're talking of you know, two different sort of levels, and, and it's interesting as someone who studies individual decision making, that you can talk about this idea of a sustainable, an individual making decisions for themselves that makes their life sustainable, right? What gets me to tomorrow, a year from tomorrow, 10 plus tomorrow, whatever, versus the scales that we're talking at in terms of the policy and the governance. And if we think across all three issue levels of, or all three pillars of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social, in any given decision, you can think of them as the weighted average equation. Right? And in some of my decisions of what community to live in or what school to send my kids to or so on and so forth, I might trade off those three differently. I'm going to have different weighting functions in a manner of speaking. This is where my... Exactly, exchange. And so this is, you know, we can talk about sort of what the weighted function is for, the, for, this, for society, and that might well be where the political context in any given moment in time determines that weighting function. Right? And yet at the level of the individual, which are often where a lot of the decisions are occurring, where each of us is deciding just how much we want to subscribe to that overall societal 
weighting function. Those individual weighting functions need to be sort of individually thought through and understood. And the nudges of those policies and the implications of those policies need to be understood in terms of where they're going to lead behavior to. And do the two really match up? Or are we really talking about creating changes at level A, which then when we get, by the time we get to Z, actually look like a whole bunch of unintended consequences that we haven't thought through? And I feel like that sort of disconnect may well be what this is getting at, is that we're not understanding the full contextualization of where these decisions are occurring in just thinking about the decision as an isolated one. So perhaps it's more than just integrating three pillars. Maybe it's integrating three pillars given a certain context. And that that context is going to determine the trade-offs for what might be two identical countries in your graph or two very similar individuals who might then, just because of the influence of the context, make very different trade-offs and very different transitions and therefore land up dealing with sort of very different issues. So I'm not sure how to integrate all of that in this thinking, but I feel like if we can't address that and if we can't actually at least highlight that these are in, in issues that decision makers across the board, whether it's the CEO of a company, and when I talk about Argentinian agribusinesses tomorrow, we'll go into this, versus the Minister of Agriculture in Argentina, it doesn't matter who it is that's thinking through, when this integration falls apart, to me, that's the definition of sustainability falling apart in some ways. Yeah, when, when one of these priorities you know, out, yeah, or dominates the other. Any other thoughts? How are we doing on time? Are we way ahead of schedule? Um, we have about 35 minutes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, oh, did you have? Oh, I thought you were waiting to buy. Um, so, Robbie, I'm a sustainability officer and um, for an institution, and and but I thought this was great because I've seen people. To the extent that people bring things to me, I've seen them use all five of these framing to say why I should help them or work with them or why their issue is a sustainability issue. So it's, it's really helpful to me. I, um, so I kind of want to ask you, so on, on, and this is more about the, the four and five. So in the socially driven one, um, I, I guess my overall question is what's the, what's, how do these work in different, cultures, you've kind of hinted at that about acceptability of these different approaches. So, for example, in, you know, a, an American individualistic um, society, uh, a lot of times, the and an affluent society, the implication is that we have to do all the tech-driven stuff first, then you can come and ask me to change my society or, or change myself personally four and five. So, um, so I guess the, you know, is it possible that, that we are kind of stuck with pushing, someone like me is stuck with push all the tech stuff until it becomes untenable um, so that I can have the conversation about socially driven? Right. Well, so this is, this is what's happening with, with climate change, I would argue, is that um, it's suddenly becoming a public issue because we're because we're beginning to experience uh, or more people are beginning to experience this at a, at a larger scale so uh, suddenly values begin to change I, I would argue that's you know maybe maybe what how we can explain this very recent shift in attitudes about uh, LGBTQ issues right uh, as uh, as more and more people realized hey I know I know someone who's gay. I know someone, right? It became it became a much more uh, landscape-wide issue because people could personally identify with it. Um, so, um, at the institutional level, um, how? So, I, I think that you can work with it on two fronts, right? Um, at a, at a university, there's a there's a whole population of students that you can work with on the value change front, right? On the the socially driven front, um, because presumably, right, environmental decisions at the university affect the population, and I think it's probably 
especially challenging at the university because the population rotates out every four years, right? Or you have a you don't have a constituency that is that is permanent. Um, uh, I'm kind of I lost track of the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the the point I was kind of getting at is I, I think this is this is true that what's happening in in a lot of United States universities and probably companies as well is you you end up pushing the technology because you don't have to bother people and you don't have to challenge them socially. Um, and so I was kind of wondering, asking you to almost predict, like, is, is that how we have to do it uh, in our society? Whereas uh, it could be that other societies have a more of a fresh start. If you're not affluent and individualistic to start with, you m may be able to move faster with these socially driven pieces. Yeah. Okay. Now I remember exactly how I wanted to respond to that. The first, I have two, two responses. And one is that um, when we talk about social change, there is always this risk. Or no, it, it's, it's almost inevitable. We, we get into the realm of the sacred, right? What is sacred? What don't we want to change? What is protected by our values? And, um, and so you could, you could argue, you know, someone could argue that in the United States, the American dream, having your own house and your own car and, and consuming as much as, as, you, as you want is, um, is sacred, right? That, I mean, I, I don't agree with that, but in political discourse, that's a, that's a sacred thing. And so how do we change, how do we change that? Um, and I guess, uh, and so, so on one hand, we could wait for it to be obvious and in our face to the point where we can't deny it anymore. But I also think that, especially in a country as big as the United States, but even in an institution, um, there are niches, right? There are pockets of people that have different values that don't operate at the same level. And actually, this, this connects to my research. I'm looking at eco-villages because they don't follow the same rules. And I'm interested in rule breakers, people that um, have a different set of priorities and how that to them is very rational. It's very rational to live in a community where you share four cars and um, you grow your own food and you produce your own electricity and it's a much lower cost of living, but it's also a lot more labor and a lot more time communicating and uh, expressing your feelings and things that we don't find natural. Um, and so within uh, innovation and sustainability, social science literature, there's discussions about what's called strategic niche management, um, where um, governance is a matter of, crea of, of identifying and fortifying these groups of people that operate at a different level. And so one example in the literature that is now a little bit dated is, um, you know, a while ago, electric cars were, they, they worked out all the kinks in this, in this niche. Um, they, didn't work on the road for a lot of reasons. There wasn't complementary technology um, that wasn't feasible to create. The law didn't support electronic vehicles. Um, but th people worked on them because they saw a, a, a value in them that could not be internalized by the market. Um, and, and so if, uh, and the government and institutions can protect these, right, through subsidies. They can protect them through giving them physical spaces to work and making it easier for them to do something that we might see as irrational. Um, and so at an institution, if, if I would say, if you're trying to drive institutional change, um, and, and even at the city scale, you can identify these pockets of people that operate by different rules. And when the landscape changes, right, you, can, you have an alternative there ready to go. Um, and you can uh, uh, evade, you know, uh, societal scale collapse when, for example, emitting carbon dioxide becomes infeasible. But I don't know, there are probably other responses to that. If anyone else can think of how, how we can, can we penetrate the sacred? That I think is like, that's another major question, right? How do we decide what, what values are good and bad, that's really hard to do. And that's something that we're not, uh, in America, we, we're not accustomed to the government uh, in working in that, in that realm, right? That's off limits. Right. If, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd suggest that in some ways the ones near the top, the one 
for example, the idea that the social is just a, a pillar are, are part of the problem because they, they house anything and everything you want to throw in there. It's, you know, it's kumbaya singing and all of that kind of thing that goes so that, you know, we can all be within that pillar and we don't have to disagree. Um, so we don't end up getting challenged by, you know, no one is challenging the sacred. It's this, we will all just get along in, in here. And, um, and sometimes nothing happens. The, res the result is nothing. Changes. Deciding, that's a very political process, right? Deciding, deciding what counts as, what are we going to count as social sustainability? What's going to go into this operational definition, no matter how you're using it. Um, you know, I, and, and some of these things contradict each other. Um, I, I'm trying to think of them offhand. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right that if, if you just throw any variable that isn't money and isn't green into that category, then you're not going to, you're not going to move forward very fast because you're trying to, you're trying to please everyone at once. Yeah. So, so I think that a, a, you know a very real opportunity for this network is to do some thinking around those categories, and you know offer some guidance on when it makes sense to use which particular frameworks and why, and which ones really maybe we are better staying away from, right? Because I, I think that, that whole issue that our colleague just raised, it was there at the beginning of the incep I mean, at the inception of this network. But we have to make some headway. Yes, we, we do. Because I, I think it, it, it stops if any and everything, that's why I asked you the question, so what is social? <laughs> if any and everything goes, then it's nothing. And especially when you're dealing with decision makers, um, whether it's related to civil infrastructure or otherwise, they are really looking for defensible frameworks. And uh, they're looking for uh, things that they can actually, uh, uh, you know, place some confidence in, in, in advancing society. So I, I think that's a challenge then for the network. And it would be nice to see some guidance come out of this with some very real examples that really showcase some best practice thinking, etc. Um, about three years ago, I went to uh, Switzerland, and I told some of the people on my table the story, so please bear with me, I tell the story again, or maybe I'll tell another one. And we went to visit the Gothard Base Tunnel. You know, the Gothard Base Tunnel is, I want to say, is 1,800 feet below the ground. They buried the tunnel to link the south of Europe uh, to the north of Europe because they found out that um, air quality was getting very bad in the Alps. And in some pockets of the Alps, they've seen incidents of cancer rates go up for kids. And so they started thinking about uh, the projections for cargo were going up. How well do we, I mean, how can we address this problem? So rather than tweaking it at the margin, right, maybe do some operational measures to address congestion a little bit here, and they just decided to go for a transformational solution. And they decided they are going to route all the traffic underneath the Alps. It costs a significant amount of money. I can't remember, if I knew I was going to give this uh, example, I would have done the research before I came, but I want to say something on the order of $10 billion or, or more. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we took this trip as part of a, there were some academics, some practitioners, some government officials. Uh, it was part of a, a, really like a reconnaissance tour to understand how transportation systems are being built. And I remember that a lot of people kept asking, uh, what was the benefit cost analysis? I mean, what was the benefit cost ratio for this facility? We never got an answer till we left. And, and the Swiss kept saying, four words or five. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. So, um, you know, part of my 
thinking afterwards, after this trip, was, you know, I kept reflecting on it. And in a sense, I felt you could look at it through the lens of, listen, we understand that the way we are going is not good for the health of our children. That's human capital. Um, we have the ability, economically, economic capital, to change this in a way that pre preserves the health of our children and future generations. We have the ability. Okay, let's do some creative thinking. Sink in that investment, right? And um, we expect that we are going to preserve this health, and that's sufficient. But if you start thinking about it, there are some linkages to the other types of capital. Because the Alps, I think they have a, you know, they bring a lot of tourists. That translates to what? Economic revenue. So if the quality of the air is going to go down, it's going to affect economic revenue, it's, go it's going to affect other things. So um, I just give this as an example. To me, it was a very profound example of you know, sustainable development thinking, even though it may not have been crafted as such. But I think one of the opportunities of this network is to really bring some clarity to the thinking around definitions. Because I think if you can't define it, it, it limits the ability to really move forward, doesn't it? Uh, and, and, and so this is something that I think would be very nice to see come out of, of this network. Was it? Oh, awesome. It's my job. I'd like to thank you very much for what you just asked, because we, I'm basically here looking for that kind of framework. That's, that's what I came, came to the session or sessions in general. I'm a local activist, so to speak, and trying to move forward in sustainability across all, all three pillars, so to speak. My background was environmental, and I'm trying to figure out how or what we put in a, 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 a social sustainability framework or a general sustainability framework that in, includes the social because that's exactly what I was tasked. So any input from anybody, gratefully received all day and tomorrow. Yeah. Any, any, any direct response, responses to that? Um, well, I, I think, well, let me actually just keep this in the crowd so I don't have to keep running back and forth. Um, one of the reasons that I really liked Dr. Amakudzi's work is that she chose a social variable based on what was valuable, right? On, on, on a social metric that was important to the community um, or important to a specific project. So the, the, the study that I cited in this presentation uh, was looking at um, congestion, traffic congestion, right? As a measure of quality of life, as a social variable. And what cost, at what, co at what environmental and resource consumption costs does that improvement in congestion come? And so I think uh, one, way, one way to approach it, right? Uh, well, what, we've what, what I would say is that there are different ways that you can handle this. You can just make a list of the things, of the social variables that, that you like. Um, and if you have data on it, then, then that's easy. Um, but I also think one exercise that um, you could go through is what economic and environmental constraint, what, what, are, what are the environmental and economic constraints on other social variables? So for, yeah, um, so, uh, so uh, if we were to, for example, m maximize or just say, okay, we're not gonna cut down any more forests at all. Um, and what are the what are the what are the implications of this, right? In in your head, if if, if let's say the environmental value is forest conservation, uh, economically, that uh, in the short term that could be a challenge because uh, you, you you lose uh, the opportunity cost is property tax revenue, um, and you know revenue that you would have gotten from development. And socially, um, it, you know, you, I could think of several things, right? It, it could be um, 
you lower the supply of housing that raises the cost of housing, that could be a disadvantage for low-income housing. Um, and so I, I think one way you could look at it, and, and one way that seems encouraging to me, is project-oriented sustainability. Decision or, so how, how are, what variables do we need to consider when we make decisions? And that's different than a scorecard, right, a report card. And so one of the speakers that we're going to see later um, is a, a panel from sustain, uh, uh, the leader of Sustain Charlotte, and he made the sustainability report card, which is an important base. It's a, it's a way to begin the assessment, but it's not looking at specific projects. It's just where are we, how, what, is it, what standards can we hold ourselves to? Um, so I think if I could, if I, if the question I would ask in return is, what are the priorities of your group? Um, and what are, the, what are the challenges that your, your group identifies? Uh, um, you know, why, why is sustainability important? Uh, and I think that varies at different scales and different, for different communities. But I think that the concept of social sustainability can be used to leverage, um, to leverage environmental and economic change, right? Because you, you place a condition upon uh, other, other types of changes. Thank you. Th thank you. Let me, let me um, ask a little different kind of, kind of question. And that is in bringing up your example of the, what's the value of cutting down the forest. And it seems to me that there's a measurement issue here that's real tough with, with social sustainability. And environmentally, you can look at and measure what it's doing to the ecosystem and economically. But in terms of social systems, I think you have to think of what, who, who are you, who's doing that value? that it may be a community that, that lives in that forest and that's their home and that's critical, critical and that, that I would be very high. And there's other folks who look at the mysterious forest as an evil place mm -hmm. and would like to have the forest cut down because it's an evil place and they, and they don't place any, any value there. And so when trying to um, look at social sustainability, I always have difficulty thinking how do you um, evaluate that well, not only the communities of interest in terms of, of space, and one of your points, we just lost your screen, um, but in terms of, of, of time. Right. That who's going to value it and look at a, the forest again in a, nat in, a, in a national park? It's a whole new dimension. I think Poonam probably has a, right? I don't know that there's necessarily a response to that as yeah. much as there's an acknowledgement of the fact that, um, you know, inherent within when we talk about social, the role of social sustainability, we also need to understand that the consequences to that social leg are often in a very different time frame than the time frames where you see the impact on an environmental basis or on an economic basis. I mean, we have an artificial deadline for most economic uh, measures. It's either a fiscal year or it's if you look at Wall Street, it's quarterly earnings, right? So th there are some very tangible, they're completely lines drawn in the sand, but nonetheless, there are tangible measures that have come into place, the budget for a university, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that makes it seem like it's urgent and it's important and it's very real. But what happens to the consequence of wanting to make that bottom line, so I won't do this project, I'll put the stuff in technology versus I'll hire or fire people, what are the actual social consequences to an organizational culture, let's say, or to a societal or communal? Um, the impacts on, on that may not be felt for four, five, six, seven years. What happens when farms become agribusinesses and people no longer live on those farms and you don't have knowledge being retained and you don't have social capital being developed in those communities anymore? Well, you're not going to feel that in a year. Right. You're going to, that time frame, that temporal component, which, you know, goes back to this idea of weighted averages. It's like, are we waiting at a point in time? Or are we waiting across time? And I think that's a question to ask yourself as you're thinking in terms of, you know, what do I say yes to and what do I say no to? Again, it's, it's what's the time frame here? And, you know, am I thinking about sort of the level of generational thinking as well? So I have some individual research that shows that when we believe in technology, we're a lot more willing to pass on social problems and environmental problems for future generations mm -hmm. because we have this innate belief that technology will somehow solve them tomorrow. But today, the problem I have is economic and let me solve that. Right. So we prioritize things very differently in that sense and we have a psychological sort of mindset. So yeah, to your point, you know, 
is it the value of the forest today with everyone who's impacted today? Is it the discounted value of the forest tomorrow? Is it the discounted value across time? And we can't even begin to imagine the true value of that forest when you start to discount it across time. And, and it again sort of goes back to this idea that you, that, that concept of what social needs to get defined and crystallized fairly well to then understand what that measuring parameter becomes that you then have to sort of trade off against. That, that's clearly the challenge to this is, right? We, everyone, I don't want to say everyone, but it's, it's easy to agree uh, how we can maximize economic capital. There's, there's a lot of consensus. Uh, not pure, right? Someone might say, well, GDP is better than GNI. Or, yeah, but, but money is it, it's money, right? Um, right, it, and uh, I mean, ecological footprint, there's a lot of consensus around it, but it's only one way to measure environmental capital. But um, there's more consensus around uh, envi what counts as environment um, than what counts as social. And so one of the challenges of social sustainability is that it uh, involves a lot of things that can't be measured. And so how do we address that? Well, we can measure it, right? That's one, that's one approach that we could take. That's one uh, project that if you're an academic here, um, you know, I would encourage that, you know, figure out a way that we could measure and easily compare social capital to economic capital to, um, to environmental capital. Um, and so how else, how else can we cope with, um, with that? Well, we could, we could settle on uh, a couple of indicators, um, but that, of course, forces us to make really difficult political choices. But I think we also have to recognize that you know, economic capital, the, the, the way that we measure economic capital and uh, the economic pillar is also a political choice. Right? There, are, there are other choices that we can make that define economics. Right? Uh, there's not a lot of debate around that, but why, why can't we include right, minority-owned businesses as an economic pillar? We tend to see that as social. Um, so, you know, that, that's another critique I have of the separated pillars, is that these things are all very much connected. And so I think a lot of this, I think this ultimately brings me back to, to the final point, is that there's a lot of sub subjectivity about priorities and what counts as economic and what counts as uh, environmental and what counts as social. And so ultimately, we have to figure out better ways to communicate priorities amongst individuals. And that might involve, right, maybe one, maybe one approach to that is um, relearning how to live together, right? Investing in communicating with each other, investing in collective decision making, um, like I've seen in these eco villages, right, where people are learning how to deliberate and understand what, what other people's priorities are. Yeah, but I wanted to add a comment to Poonam's. Uh, comments and it's that really value is also very it changes over time isn't it it's a dynamic function and if you know for example the example I was given about the Gothard base tunnel uh, at the end of the day I decided that uh, the benefit cost ratio uh, you, you can calculate it and it's a function of the value of the health of the children. And so the Swiss were willing to pay $10 billion plus for that. But they could only do that because they had amassed that economic capital. So they could use it to promote that social capital. And if you are thinking of communities and you are thinking of uh, just different scenarios, if you take a scenario where the life of members of a community, the lives are at stake, the value of life can go very high. Because if all of a sudden somebody is given, let's say, I don't know, four weeks to die, unless they pay for a certain kind of procedure, and the procedure is hugely expensive, if they had the money, they may, they may more than likely be willing to pay because it's a different set of circumstances. So it's just quite complicated. Um, but it doesn't mean there are not ways to simplify it to be able to make some reasonable decisions. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that 
I, I t I'm not sure that um, social sustainability is any more difficult or uh, a concept to grapple with than is economic or environmental sustainability. But I, I also think um, if in can't we say, well, social sustainability, we have to have some group unit or other. We have to have a, a unit that is a group, more than one person. Otherwise, it's not social. You know? we, we, th there has to be some sort of shared values or priorities that, and then there has to be a, a looking toward continuing into the future. So a continuous future. So we want to, we need to have a group. We need to have shared values or priorities. We need to have a future, a continuous future. And in fact, whether there are technologies involved or not, that's what people come to when they come to an officer at an institution or their political representative and they say, we've got a problem, or we don't have enough water, you know, or, and so what you need then, uh, and, and I think what often happens is that you, um, it's in the quest for social sustainability that these problems get identified and addressed. If we didn't have this quest um, as, as a group that's independent of an economic organization or can be defined separately from an economic organization. And uh, I think Paul Thompson did a good job at defining um, sort of, in a very basic kind of way, economic sustainability. He said, okay, well, what, if you're, what you're thinking about when you're thinking about economic sustainability is you're thinking about substitution. If I can't use one resource, can I use another and get the same result? Um, and when he's thinking about environmental sustainability, he's thinking about functional integrity. Is this environmental unit, can we preserve it? Is it going to continue in the future? Functional integrity is quite different from substitution. They don't, you don't want to just substitute one resource for another. And then he thought of social sustainability as quite difficult to grapple, to get hold of. But he, so he was thinking about it as really the way people have been addressing it is in terms of a social movement. You know, you have people who are concerned about social justice or environmental justice, and they latched on to or start to use this other term. But is it helpful? Does it help us? Um, get beyond to something beyond what we would have if we just thought of it as a social movement, uh, the need for environmental justice, the need for social justice, the need for inclusivity, um, uh, vulnerable populations, all of those kinds of issues. And I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that you can probably think of social sustainability in as simple a fashion as any of these others. Um, I think it, so I think that conversation is really interesting to get at what you were saying would be a, a great result of this group in terms of forming some sort of framework or definition of social sustainability, especially as it compares to what you were saying about it's so context driven. Um, so for instance, when you said what, if the mayor of Charlotte walked in right now and, said, and he asked what is social sustainability, if you looked at him and said it's how you're going to get reelected, that's a really practical understanding. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so you ha there's this, you, you have to understand there's a difference between the technical definition of something and the practical definition of something and the importance of the context there. So the definition will mean one thing, or to a mother it means that's how your, your, your child is going to, yeah. Um, and so, and I, with the, the Swiss Alps, you know, it's the right thing to do, that, that may not may not mean anything to somebody whose election cycle is up in two months, you know? So it's kind of, yeah, on a practical level, the context matters more and more and more. I think at 
this point in the conversation. <laughs> um, I, to the issue of you, you included time in, as one of your four criteria. I'd also like to include boundary. How far out does it go in terms of, um, again, this was sort of the conversation that you got me thinking about this morning. Do we stop at the nation state or are we looking at something else? And I really do like this Goddard Tunnel. <laughs> Um, the other thing I'd just like to, being uh, in the business uh, and management field, I just would like to alert everyone to the softness of economic models <laughs> and economic criteria. We, we seem to be fuzzy about social and assume that the economic, and that's just not true. They, they have a very strong ideological support behind them, and so therefore they're sometimes taken as true. But it certainly does not mean that they correspond to reality any more than what we're, we're struggling with this morning. And I guess I'd just like to, the Goddard Tunnel, I think, is such a wonderful example because I'm interested in ignorance and decision-making under ignorance. And I think in a way, um, while I'm very careful to bring um, Rumsfeld into the conversation, <laughs> we could see this as an unk-unk, an unknown unknown, where what we're trying to do is apply rationalistic um, models and reasoning and ROI, and that's why I loved it when the Swiss backed off to an area of ignorance where we may not know the long-term implications and we may not be able to calculate even costs um, for our generation or the future. So I don't know that it was so much a, a sense of, of um, you know, just belief in the future as in these situations it appears that most decision makers tend to move relatively um, creatively. They sort of, they're, they're, there's some modeling being done of what do you do when you, don't, when you can't calculate and our rationalistic, you know, technologically driven societies that tell us we should be able to, and you still have to decide. And so they, the standard example they give is, of course, the, uh, 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 blanking on his name, the guy who landed on the Hudson. And the fact that he was able to rapidly transfer all of the knowledge he had from a, from a lateral and reapply it and try it out. And they said, so this is, again, um, I think this idea of trying to reach clarity may be a false notion in a way. I think what we're trying to do is what are the processes, and I come back to your social movement idea, yeah. what are the processes that will allow us to articulate and refine further yeah. for the mayor or, you know, um, as opposed to trying to come up with a calculus? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's exactly right. And it's something that I think about a lot in the, the bottom one, right? per, person-centered sustainability. Uh, my original, I think, even in the, the slide that I've neglected to change, I think it said inclusive decision making. Um, I decided to change that, but what I, what I have in mind is a, a new way of understanding and expressing um, intentions, right? Um, and, and I think that requires a, a major transformation, right? It, it requires that we decide to invest in understanding each other and um, and, and communicating with each other. I guess I'm pointing to something a little bit different but related, and that has to do with the cognitive models. And what I'm suggesting is that we have also to, to understand the model base that we're working from and to be willing to, to shed those or to play with those perhaps as individuals and hmm. collectives like the Swiss were. And, so, and the Swiss, can you, I mean, this is what's so wonderful. The Swiss said they didn't know the ROI. I mean, you know, they, they are the capitalists. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is just, you know, this is so. No, no, but I'm saying that they were not, that was, this was, this was not their, so in any case, I think it also has to do with the models. That's, that's a longer conversation. So. I forgot we have a, um, the cross-site um, presentation session starting at 310, so this will be a couple minutes early, which should be fine. I'm not sure where that is. that in the individual room? Is that all here? So it's in the atrium. There's there's yes. food there. Yes, exactly. This is you. This is where you use your. This is where you use your laptop to look at other presentations that are uh, happening happening at other sites. And you're also uh, you're also welcome to come in here to if you need if you want to talk with one of the other presenters, you can come and we can use Adobe Connect to talk with them as well. Although although I did just get notification that London is going to the pub for dinner now, so they're not, <laughs> they're not available any longer. A socially sustainable decision, perhaps. And we can be again here at 3.30 in half an hour for the panel on uh, Queen City Social Sustainability. Oh, yeah.
Yeah, that, that's going to be good. Thank you.